The VR Report Podcast with David Gino. Hey everyone, welcome to the VR Report. I have my guest, Don Carson. He is the creative genius behind Walkabout Mini Golf. Uh, for some of you in VR, that's probably one of your favorite go to applications, especially if you want to hang out with friends, play some golf, uh, and experience something pretty magical while playing something as simple as miniature golf. So um, I'm, I'm sure, Don, you're going to do a lot better job introducing yourself. So maybe introduce yourself to the audience. Well, let's see. I'm Don Carson. I, um... I've worked in the theme park and the video game industry for about 40 years after graduating from college as an illustration major. Uh, I was the kind of kid that drew all the time and really just was looking for a career where I could make money drawing. And illustration seemed to be the road to that. And as soon as I graduated, I realized I really didn't like commercial illustration at all. And what I really loved was I loved doing the, the concept work, all the front end part of producing an image. And I was kind of bored with the finished work. And uh, I talked to my uh, the director of the illustration department, and I said, is there a job where you can just do the front stuff and not do the finished stuff? And she said, no. <laughs> so, uh, so, so I'm living proof that you can actually have a career doing just the front end stuff. And so um, I also realized that I, what I really liked, even, along with drawing, was um, I love the theater. And my grandparents lived near Disneyland, so we would go to Disneyland often. And it sort of dawned on me when I graduated from college that that was actually a job you could have. That the people I never thought about it. That there's actually people whose job it was to design those rides. And so that became my north star, sort of my Everest. And I worked uh, as a freelance illustrator, but then eventually the art director for the Renaissance Pleasure Fairs in uh, Southern and Northern California. And that sort of bridge the using drawings as drawing as a skill to to inform the design of places, and in this case Renaissance fairs, and that mix of illustration and placemaking was what finally got me in the door in 1989 at Walt Disney Imagineering. And uh, what was great about Imagineering was it really was sort of my second university training, and. Uh, and Walt was sort of the, the specter that gave us artists permission to think about the stuff we were designing in ways that other mediums hadn't. You know, this, this sort of almost cinematic idea of how to take people through a place. Uh, it's closest, I mean, it's, it's certainly close to the amusement park industry, the sort of carny ride world, but it's more close to the, the movie and the theater world except rather than being sat, rooted, bolted to the ground in, a, in, a, in an auditorium, your seat moves through a space and you're the camera and your, your eyes and your neck become the, the, the pan and swivel as you move from scene to scene. So it behooves the artist who's designing it to think in those more storytelling ways. And, uh, and so that's what Lynn realized that there was some potential in the video game world in the mid 90s to take these same principles I was learning both in illustration and at Imagineering and apply it to virtual places. And a lot of it was for selfish reasons. And that was as a designer, you hope that the finished product looks as much as possible like your work. <laughs> and uh, when it's filtered through a thousand people and a billion dollar budget and lots of scrutiny, you're lucky if in your career there's three or four things you can say that's exactly how I intended it to be but when your projects are smaller you have much more creative control over the finished product and so the work that I'm doing now with Mighty Coconut and the, the wonderful team I'm working with there on Walkabout uh, we we have the the privilege of being able to create basically full theme park attractions that release every six weeks instead of every five years so, um, so that's, that's where I am currently. That's fantastic. What's really sets walkabout mini golf separately from any other experience is that it actually feels like a theme park ride, even though you're not moving, <laughs> you're, you're actually going through these different set designs that have great lighting. Um, you're very, you, you are able to optimize the graphics that have a lot of detail, uh, and it has a sense of personality at each different course. It's really unique. Can you elaborate? your experience as a Disney Imagineer and how it influenced your work uh, at Walkabout Mini Golf with, with Mighty Coconut? 
Well, certainly. At Imagineering, we were we were taught that the most important aspect of our design process was story, and story with and we sort of call it story with a capital S, which is that there is a, a reason for every choice that's made based upon a narrative. And uh, the thing I think people stumble on when they hear that is they think of a linear story where you have chapters or you have events that happen sequentially. And when we're talking about story, we're talking more about there are rules of engagement for the design. And I think a good example is the water park Blizzard Beach, which is a Disney water park in Florida. Its story is there was a storm. And that's as simple as you could possibly have. There was a storm. The wind came from this direction. So all the buildings lean in the same direction. <laughs> and, and every gag and every bit of the motif is responding to this idea that there had been a storm. And so uh, that's how simple a story can be. Um, delivering upon that, uh, not, contradicting, not contradicting, contradicting that storyline uh, is, I think, what makes... Uh, a, an environment or a theme park attraction successful. And so we try to do that with Walkabout. Can you explain in terms of designing these environments, as you say, for VR and how that differs from designing for theme parks and how they might be similar? Well, they're more, I think they're more similar than they, they are different. Uh, I, I got the job by writing them a fan letter during COVID because my fellow Ex Imagineers and I were playing walkabout to just be together and hang out. And we just could not help but notice that a lot of the design decisions they were making were very much like the ones that we were making in the theme park world. One of the ways in which we approach a theme park attraction is um, you design to meet the expectations of your audience. So if you're going to experience a pirate ride, you're going to you're, you're going to lead with those really tropey kind of obvious things. And once you've established and sort of given a comfort to the player or your audience, that's when you can start to be playful and exceed those expectations. So we try to approach that with all of the walkabout courses, that when you first arrive, you get the sort of establishing shot idea of what, what this is and what your relationship is to it. And as you progress through the course, you're meandering through little details that build upon your expectations and then start playing with those expectations. Um, and then another thing that we, we tend to do in the theme park world and we're doing more in Walkabout is that the placement of props is there to support that establishing shot that we gave you. And we're also suggesting that, that people have been here, that it has a history and uh, there's a tremendous amount of magic that one can can sort of add to an environment by how props are placed. We call it set decking. Uh, I think it probably comes more from the movie world than it is the game or theme park world. But there's a pass where we go several times through the environment to create story vignettes, little moments that 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 support the story but aren't vital parts of the story. And it also allows the players to stumble upon these little vignettes. And they're a little bit like they get to come up with the punchline. They get to see the lead up and then they get to decide by like, like a detective what's happened here. Um, and I think that there may be only two or three of these elements in one course, but it, it adds to the depth and richness of the experience that makes your memory of having been there uh, deeper and richer. That's fascinating. In terms of those props that you mentioned, basically you're creating a backstory. So psychologically for the player, they may be connecting the dots or having some familiarity of this environment, but they may not figure it out, but that causes then engagement. Is, is that the, is that one of the tenants is, is what you're using for, for this, uh, Absolutely. this type of, Imagine that I think just to survive in the physical world, we're all pretty much detectives. When we go into a new place, we're constantly deducing where's the entrance, where's the exit. How do I relate to this new place? Whether it's a Walmart or it's a new restaurant, you know, where's the bathroom? You know, what are the clues in the environment that helps me relate to and understand it? Those environments that are reassuring and that we enjoy being in are the ones that kind of set those, the make 
those obvious. You hmm. don't want to look foolish and walk into the kitchen by accident at the, at the restaurant. You want to feel as though that you're the adventurer, but you found it easy to figure out what the next thing is. Um, it's breadcrumbs. It's a smoking gun. Is it, it's, it, what is it about the, the, the layout of these objects that supports my idea of what this overall place is, but also gives me more insight into the kind of people who may have just walked out a minute ago and I'm just witnessing their smoking cigarette or their whatever that they, they were in the middle of doing. <laughs> and also we'll use cause and effect so that you can see, uh, oh, I see what happened. You know, this fell over. It's very much like a Rube Goldberg. Oh, I see the ladder fell over and he was painting. And then there's this line of paint that goes all the way down the wall. And then you see the wet footprints walk away. Uh, you get to, to, to create the story that in your own imagination, you get to go, you get to be the, the, the hero of, the, of deducing what's happened here. And then if you're the first person to approach it, then you can go tell the other players that are behind you, oh, you got to go over here and see this is really funny. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. You know, I, I think one thing that differentiates um, Walkabout is the sense of spectating. Like it was the first time that you can, you can play with someone head to head and then you can actually choose where you are in the course and where you can view it. And you can even go into giant mode and then see, see the golf course in, in a miniature form. Um, what other um, theme park design principles did you add specifically to Walkabout Golf that you can share with some of our audience? I think... I think the reason why theme parks work so well and what's so unique about them is that you're, you're experiencing it while being able to touch the elbow of the person who's sitting next to you. The, the experience is most, most likely a shared one. Certainly people go to the theme parks by themselves, but more often it's a shared experience. And what Walkabout does because of the multiplayer is it gives context for human interaction. Um, and then I think what's unique about, of all things, miniature golf is that the game forces individuals to pause and wait while somebody else is doing an activity, which opens up conversation that may not be at all related to the game. In fact, usually it isn't related to the game. Uh, and then it's, it's punctuated by sort of laughter, depending on how, how amazing or how hideously bad your shot was. And I think that as humans we haven't had virtual reality in our lives enough to be able to, in our memories, distinguish memories that were, that happened in the physical world and that had in the virtual world. We can intellectually say, obviously I was not on a space station playing miniature golf with people in, in real life, but our memories are rooted in the, the, the context of that conversation. And if we had a good time, those, those become good memories that we reflect on just like we did if we were, at a restaurant we love or, or in Venice, Italy together, you know? <laughs> um, so I hope that answers your question. It does. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, specifically when designing courses, like for example, Labyrinth and 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, um, how do you decide what elements uh, are actually, you know, and characters are actually included and what to leave out? That must be tough. Well, uh, the good news is that we have a structure, an 18 act structure based on the 18 holes. And so Incredible. we know that, so in the case of, of um, Labyrinth, we just took the movie and we broke up the movie into, luckily it has roughly about 20 scenes. So uh, we basically made each scene a whole. And, uh, and then I think part of that cinema, that cinematic sensibility that comes with uh, the Mighty Coconut's roots is that we we allow those scenes to unfold as you move through the course. So scene one, you can't see scene four. You have to actually journey. And we've designed the archways and the turns and the rising ups and the going down to reveal the next chapter so that it's always a discovery. You're not, it's not con being contradicted. Um, even in like in Atlantis, where you, it's a very open world, you can conceivably see the other holes from where you are. Our meandering path is meant to hide the view of the next hole so that it becomes a, a level of discovery as you move through the environment. Um, so in the case of 
of Labyrinth, we had very, very set movie. We wanted to be as true. We were all lovers of the movie. So there was no part of us that wanted us to do anything but deliver upon that. But it, when it came to Jules Verne, um, less so with the Nautilus, more so with the uh, with journey, uh, journey to the Center of the Earth. Sure. We wanted to hit those those beats. People people have read who have read the book or seen the Disney movie or uh, this happens, this happens, this happens. We didn't want to break that. Mm. We want first they went into this room and then they saw the giant mushrooms and then they saw the inland sea. So that that becomes our our framework. Um, it what became harder with uh, the Nautilus was that it was the first time we ever had something as compact and so full of objects, very much like a dollhouse. Uh, we had to be very, very uh, artful about lotting uh, various pieces out so that you we weren't rendering stuff you weren't seeing. Um, but uh, we all had a dream to what would it be like to go in the Nautilus. And so it was a collective, let's just pack this thing with everything we think it should have. Cool. And we did. You know, I, I appreciate the art direction and the sense of detail that you add that had a lot of flourishes that really reminded me of the movie itself. Can you explain the actual art direction process to develop um, those type of moments to make sure it's authentic? And are you having to work with IP controllers and then trying to convince them that this is right, considering that this is now in 3D, may not look mm -hmm. exactly cinematic? How does that work? Uh Let's see, that seems uh, several questions all in one. To, yeah. <laughs> to start with the IP one, um, we've been lucky that in most cases we've been approached by the IP holders who've, who've played our game. That was certainly true with Meow Wolf. And um, uh, the, they were familiar enough with our, with our backlog that they trusted us. Wow. Uh, it, it was actually quite amazing because we actually approached uh, Cyan, the creators of Myst. And we're not sure that it was weird for a game to make to, to to do an homage of a game, and they instantly just said a hard yes. We absolutely love this, and we want we want you to work on it. And in all cases, um, they've given a tremendous amount of faith that we're we're going to be able to pull it, pull it off and be do it justice. I think it was the most interesting because uh, Labyrinth was our first really big IP, and they loved that we were low poly. Because it meant they didn't have to hold our hand and talk about every texture and every you know blade of grass had to be just so they knew that we were doing a stylized interpretation, which allowed for a tremendous amount of freedom. Um, I think it's probably very similar to how the Lego movies approach or Lego games approach Harry Potter uh, or or Batman. Sure, they they're allowed the, the their universe allows for a lot of playfulness, and Labyrinth was certainly uh, certainly like that. As far as the process of creating an environment, uh, Mighty Coconut is a small uh, company. We have about 30 people now. And uh, its founder, Lucas Martel, who uh, came from the, the filmmaking world, uh, is really just a Renaissance man as far as his abilities to not only artistically design something. In fact, the, er the first courses are all him, 100%. Uh, but also he has a a technical and a storytelling ability that allows him to just happily live in the tech world and in the art world. And the beginnings of our projects happen very, very often um, in Gravity Sketch with he and Henning, uh, our course designer. Uh, and we just are scribbling in 3D in space. And within about an hour and a half, we pretty much have mapped out everything you need to know about the arrangement of the holes and the environment in the scribbliest possible way. I mean, anybody who were to come in would really have a difficult time understanding what we had just sort of mind melded. But very, very quickly, we can start adding flesh to that sketch and end up with something that uh, miraculously, because we, we designed it to scale, is already, we already know how big it is. We already mm. know what it's like to be inside of it and embody it. So something like the Nautilus, we start with a shell and we start adding floors we start feeling what's right. We start scribbling furniture and this room is this and this is here and this is the path and this is where you get here and this is the finale. Um, it all happens during those first hours in VR. Uh, I think it's also important that 
since our final product's VR, that it's important that a good percentage of our design process also happens in that medium. Um, and then it's, it, once that's established, we, we start refining and refining and refining. That happens probably uh, the first third of it is that conceptual end. The, the, the middle phase is the sort of firm it together, optimize the model, get all the props in there, get this final set deck done. And the last third is the tech art team. And that's where all the sort of magical stuff happens. That's where it starts going into Unity and we start to see lighting and visual effects and optimizing before it goes to the public. So often, even though I've really participated quite a bit in the first two phases, by the time we launch, I'm just as surprised at how so beautiful it came out because of that last push through the, the tech art team. That's so cool. So you're using Gravity Sketch. For those that don't know, it's basically like Photoshop, but for VR. You can actually do mock-ups. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Tilt Brush, but it's basically sketching the environment. So you basically sketch this uh, almost in, in scale, and then you can also, of course, manipulate it. Um, who is in that process with you? Is it like you and is it also the three modeler that has to take that sketch later on and render stuff? Is it you and also the producer? Like how, how collaborative is this or, or is it segmented the first time around? Uh, it's usually the three of us. I tend to be the, the modeler that takes it from the scribbly phase to the, I call it the placeholder model, which is the rough sort of gray box version. Um, and that sort of firms up what the, the rooms are going to start to feel like. But then as we go into the middle phase where we're starting to optimize it, uh, our schedule, because we're often working on seven courses simultaneously, an individual artist or designer will be handed it. Like, I'll be done. Here's the model. This is the intent. And then they get to spend two or three or four weeks on it. Uh, whether it's Emma who's starting to to refine the environment and bring in more props, or it's Tad who's starting working on the architectural aspects of it, and then it gets handed to someone who is going to start optimizing that to make sure that those beautiful architectural pieces are are not going to slow mm -hmm. the frame rate down. Um, and we're jumping back and forth between Gravity Sketch, which we we treat like dollhouse decorating, you know, move the furniture in at scale. Uh, and Blender, which is where we're doing a lot of the texturing and refining before it goes into uh, to Unity to, in the last third of the project. That's great. And in terms of design reviews, are you also des doing design reviews in in VR in headset? Yeah, we will do uh, play test reviews as a company like within weeks of the first design, as as soon as the holes are playable. Uh, even if we know that they're not the finished design, uh, we break up into multiple teams and we, we, sometimes we have reviews where we just are talking about gameplay and kind of ignoring the environment because it's still really nebulous. Mm -hmm. And then later we'll play through specifically for, for how's this looking, how's it working. And then it's also where you catch lots of little, you know, openings in the mesh where things, it, it, nothing, there's nothing like being in VR to discover what's broken. You know, <laughs> you can you can fool yourself in Blender that oh this all looks great, but once you get down there and you can see everything at the size of your hand, uh, it you, all the little tiny issues start to show up. That's super cool. Most people in the VR industry, I mean, believe it or not, actually spend a lot of time and walk about. You know, just hanging out or actually you know discussing work. Um, you know, almost like they do in real life in the older yester years, I guess, you know, playing on the golf course. It's so social, right? Um, how are you designing or are you intentionally adding creative direction for people to be more social and walk about? Go? Like there, there's something different in terms of those social interactions. How are those designed is what I'm asking. Uh, well, initially, the first courses, if you go through them, you'll actually see a sort of a design arc from the very initial you know, like a um, tourist trap and through the initial designs were pretty purely highly designed miniature golf parks. But when we started getting more fan mail saying I've reconnected with my dad or my brother and I were 600 miles apart, we just never spend time together. And now we see each other twice a week and talk about family. Uh, we and, and that they play a round of mini golf and then fly around for an hour and talk about <laughs> talk about their home life we thought we need to create 
little places for them to do that. So we do a combination of things, like in the Nautilus, at the right at the at the uh, on the bridge. There's an entire lounge there uh, designed specifically for you to you know. Or it, it doesn't affect your game at all. You just go sit down and watch the water go by. Uh, in Nautilus, you can actually ride uh, the sea life, so you can hop on the back of a whale. And I've had like hour and a half long conversations from the back of a sea turtle with <laughs> friends all over the country. Yeah, it, it's designed on purpose for that that human interaction above and beyond the fact that you're playing golf. That's fantastic. Speaking of Nautilus, I, I almost sense that there's a there's a big push on narrative, even though there is no narrative. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you design that? How, how do you make that happen? I think the both the walkabout and in the theme park world, uh, where the a theme park attraction work, does not work is when you force a narrative that is linear. Uh, there are examples of some attractions that have worked, but if you look at sort of the classics like Pirates of the Caribbean, you'd be hard pressed to figure out who the characters are, or what they're doing, or why they're doing it. You know that you were. You were underground in caves where there were skeletons. You know there was a town being sacked and then lit a fire. But that's kind of it, you know. It's much more about uh, the joy of of being in the space and being able to say, "Oh, it, something happened, and then something else happened." Um, even we will, in our early design phases, will will get a little too deep in the weeds with, you know, the depth of the story. And sometimes that depth, I think certainly for the villain slayers, we've come up with sort of deep paragraphs worth of information about who these villains are, but then we purposely don't publish that. Um, it is only used to inspire the, the choices, that, you know, what kind of chairs and what the rooms look like and how we support that, that story and allow the imagination of the visitors to fill in the blanks. So for laser layer, the hard mode is at, is the, is after a villain's convention. Um, so there's all like the half-eaten canapes and you know champagne glasses tilts over napkins everywhere. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and all these gr unreadable graphics for, for you know, evil products that, that they were promoting. Uh, we don't need to tell you anything about that fair. If you've ever been to a con, you know what, it's, what that's like. <laughs> and... Uh, and then the robots that were welding things in the easy course are serving drinks and, and hors d'oeuvres in the hard course. That's enough of a story. And then if we had, if we had made you read a pamphlet to, to better understand the space, then we've kind of failed mm. to, uh, to uh, it, we, we allow you to, to add the narrative yourself, uh, especially in conversation. Like, oh, look over here. This is funny. This guy was heating up his, his, is hot chocolate with the laser, but it, 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 it bore a hole in his sandwich first. You know, <laughs> I don't need, you don't need to know who, who that guy was um, to make, to, for that to be funny. That's great. And in terms of the actual set design, like I've noticed like posters and different signage, is there kind of a, a meta story going along with those type of props and those communications? And how do you go about even designing that? Well, uh, uh, Zach Alexander is our graphic designer. He's our, t our 2D guy. And he's responsible for certainly all the advertising images. And, but he's also responsible for the sort of the color language and the lighting concepts before it's handed to lighting. And he does all of our graphics. So I think one of the things that makes walkabout courses just feel like they belong in the same universe is because they all are coming from Zach's hand and sensibility, oh, which, right. which is wonderful. Uh, but as we've been doing it, and because we're working on courses in advance, there's there's lots of Easter eggs we've put into courses that are props from future courses that we're not telling you what they are. Uh. It will only be in hindsight that you'll go, I saw that a year ago in this environment. And uh, we do that with the graphics, too, is that there's little hints, sort of playful hints to the, it's sort of the... It's the walkabout cinematic universe. Everything is interrelated in some way. And then is there a kind of a, a master style guy to keep track of all of these different <laughs> branching stories that seem so complicated? It's, uh, it's, I think the magic is because the, the model is handed to individuals who get to, to spend 
their own sort of private time with it, we just sort of organically add those pieces to it. Uh, and there, and I think for me, part of, uh, since I own so much of the front end, part of uh, my job is to kind of keep my mouth shut as we get into the later end to allow other people to to make decisions that may be different than I maybe I had imagined it. Um, this idea of there being one creator who has the master vision, I think, can be very uh, uh, have sort of a mono uh, feel about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, what makes the environment surprising is that so many sensibilities have added things to it uh, that the the final person who consumes it's not going to know there was a dispute as to which props went where, or what was what was and wasn't appropriate. Uh, I think the one of the best examples is that um, Edward, one of our uh, our lead modeler and fin and uh, optimizer of models, put a skeleton at the base of the Sweetopia factory, and it was sort of a. I, I guess that's all right. You know, we, we it was we didn't think a lot about it. And it was a good maybe 12 hours before somebody found it down there. And it became this huge, like, what the heck? I mean, here's this wonderful sort of cartoon candy land. And there's a dead body down at the bottom of it. And uh, it became a thing. Now we hide dead bodies everywhere uh, <laughs> because of that. But it, it all of a sudden added a contrast to this saccharine sweet chocolate river kind of Wonka world with this idea that maybe some OSHA guy had come and was never seen again it's because he fell down this long shaft in the candy factory. Um, that wouldn't have happened if we, there wasn't the freedom of individuals to add their own touch to each place. That's illuminating. I mean, you, you actually have Easter egg eggs like the, the dead bodies, but you actually have actual Easter eggs that are yeah. <laughs> sometimes in courses, which is fun. Yeah. Um, that's, that's fantastic in how you explain narrative. You gave a really great example of how to design uh, in VR, especially around set designs and getting into scale, which is really important. Mm -hmm. Can you explain how you do this in theme parks, designing theme parks? Because you can't design in scale. So how does that go about? Computer games sort of hit, when computer games in the sort of 90s through CD-ROMs became richer and deeper and longer playing, like 40 hours in it. Um, one of the things that I thought that, that games promised was the ability to pre-ride the ride before you built it. One of the biggest challenges with uh, making anything architectural is that you're, you're basically designing in hieroglyphs. You're designing a recipe that is an abstract two-dimensional CAD. Now, CAD drawing, back then they were hand-drafted with pencils. Um, a recipe that then would be built, and your knowledge of scale in your mind was what you was was informing what choices you made. Now, granted, you would make little scale models, and you would look in the models, and you would measure, and all that would happen to just sort of make sure that that recipe was going to be right. But inevitably, you go to the field, you'd have your hard hat on, and they would put up that tree you thought was this big, and it's this big, and it's in the wrong place, and you go, oh man, that's unfortunate. But that's also hundreds of thousand dollars to change. Anything that can bring the act of making that realization of its scale and its rela relationship being wrong earlier in the concepting phase minimizes those gotchas that Motion happen in the, in the field. Um, what's also starting to happen is that uh, more, more and more people are less able to view those elevations and plan drawings and understand what they're looking at. So we're in the theme park world, we're leveraging more and more 3D and VR to allow the participants of the team to, to wander around in this environment prior to its construction. And ultimately, even back in the 90s, my reason for embracing all this new technology was I kind of would like the finished product to look like I designed it. Like the, the choices that I made, I need to communicate with hundreds of people and have them agree with those decisions before they build it. And being able to take them by the hand and bring them inside even a, you know, a, a white model uh, early, early on in VR allows even non-creative people to go, that looks right. Or that, look, oh, I didn't have any idea that's what your intention was. Or, or these doors feel too low. Uh, it's the same in, the, in uh, Walkabout. 
uh, we're working on a, a place right now. This has happened a couple of times where we've played through it for months and months. And then all of a sudden someone says, what if we just enlarge this 20%? And then we do. And then everybody goes, oh my gosh, it's, it's perfect now. <laughs> it's like we've been living with this thing, kind of like a sweater that didn't fit. And then all of a sudden we just give ourselves a little bit more air. Um, I think also we tend to, we give ourselves a parameter of this is how much space it should be about 40 meters by 40 meters. And so we'll lock ourselves into that. And then when we give our permission, our self permission to go maybe 60 meters, all of a sudden, Oh, it just feels much better. The scale feels right. Uh, uh, the VR allows us to make those decisions quickly and early uh, in, and in theme park work too, hopefully more and more they're doing that so that these, expensive changes don't have to happen later right. on. You said something key there that you're also looking through the, um, the lens or actually the viewpoint of the person going through the ride. Yes. So are they looking through a miniature model and how does that get set up? How, 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 paint a picture for us. Yeah. Well, uh, something that I thought potentially was unique to Imagineering because I'd never seen it before is that uh, whenever they build their models, they build it at the height that you're going to view it. So even though it may be one inch to the foot, it's elevated on these tall, tall rolling platforms that allow your head to sit where the, where the vehicle would be. And so you're kind of moving around, looking from side to side, just getting all the parallax and all the things that that, that model allows for. Uh, back in the day, when I was there, we had a lipstick camera, which was this attached to a big VHS machine with the worst possible output and this giant hose this fiber optic hose that came off the back. <laughs> so we would try to fish our, our way through it. Today, we can do the same thing with our phone. Um, and that's helpful, but nothing is as helpful as your head being, you know, able to actually be where your eyes are, the, the level that you're going to experience at the ride. And what VR has done is it's made those that physical model, although a fabulous creative asset to have in your world. If your project can't afford it, a digital model allows you to to ride the ride, um, even in its pencil stage, um, at scale. That's cool. Some of your work in terms of comping up uh, different experiences, I've seen dioramas that you've built, and you've actually just used your cell phone to actually go through that yeah. experience. Can you kind of uh, elaborate on your design philosophy around that and, and uh, the inspiration? Uh, my philosophy is you grab for whatever tool does the best job of communicating the design. And early, early on, the best thing is a pen and a piece of paper and a hot glue gun, some foam core. Uh, a lot of it is you're, you're trying to figure out spaces. And so gluing a couple pieces of foam core and then taking some like cardstock paper and scribbling a little set design and then sticking it in your little rooms that you made out of, of foam core uh, at scale, but probably like one inch to the foot or half inch to the foot uh, is a really fast process. Like, well, that's not going to fit. Well, that's better. Or, and you're, there's nothing precious about the choices that you're making. Um, one of the, the dangers of, of VR and, and also now that we have the ability to real-time render sort of photo real is that sometimes we can be fooled into believing that something's more finished than it is too early in the process. And by reaching for, for old school materials, make, it, it communicates to you and to your client that we're still dreaming up stuff. Nothing's, everything can be torn out and redrawn. Um, what that allows for is that you come up with a design like within days or a couple of weeks, and then the rest of the process is just refining, refining, refining that design that you know already works because you've gone through that rough, that rough phase. Um, so we do that in VR with Gravity Sketch now for, for um, Walkabout. But for theme parks, uh, I would just as likely reach for a piece of paper as I would. Uh, uh, that makes total headset. sense. Yeah, yeah, do it quickly. Try to communicate the idea. It's very similar to game development. Uh, when I used to work at Ubisoft, I would pitch concepts very similarly, just pen and paper. Uh, if we have to make a collage cutout, we'd make some puppets to tell the story, the concept. Because if you actually build a prototype, 
fill in the world. It sometimes just misses the point of the main point or the concept that you're trying yeah. to communicate. So I think the the advice that you're giving is is really much aligned with what, how I think. Keep it simple. Really focus on the concept that you're trying to get the viewer to experience and then worry about all the details and polish and how the world and art direction may look later. Yeah, exactly right. And there's a charm to those early sketches and an energy that's in those early sketches. Uh, students will say, I'm really worried I want to get into this industry, but I don't draw well. Well, I mean, it, it, it helps to be able to draw well as you advance through through the your career. But uh, early on, a bad, a bad drawing can illustrate a good idea. So a stick figure drawing can illustrate how Wiley Cody is going to catch the, you know, with the dotted line and the stick example. figures. Um, the, uh, and the same is true. I don't know how to use 3D. Well, if you know how to draw on in 2D and scan it and cut it out in flats, arrange the flats in 3D at scale and then experience the flats. Those, someone else can replace those with dimensional pieces, but but don't allow your your inability to be a, a fabulous artist to stop you from dreaming up projects. Just start doing them. That's that's really cool. Going back to walkabout, we we talked about this chapter based approach in terms of designing each hole, maybe based on different scenes of a movie. If it's based on an IP like that, how do you manage the simplicity? but at the same time provide challenge when designing each hole? Um, well, I, I'm i mainly environmental focused. Henning and Lucas are the master, uh, master hole makers. And what's kind of amazing is that they don't repeat themselves. I think, I think we're well over 450 or so hole designs and each is unique. Um, each has a whole as a, a shape language that is unique to the environment. So a, a lot of that conversation is how how do we reflect the environment in the layout of the miniature golf hole. The other thing too is that we also understand that no matter how high gluten gluten we might feel we're being in an environment, ultimately we're just mini golf, and so it gives, takes a lot of pressure <laughs> off us having to be uh, you know overly artistic. Um, and then the other thing too is that because we have the limitation, we want to be on uh, tethered, untethered headsets. So we know that we have to be low poly. If we can be really low poly, that means we can get more objects in the world. And that density creates a richness, especially as it's light baked, that forgives how incredibly simplistic the models are. Um, that we even are testing ourselves sometimes to make something even more simple and abstract and simplistic just so we can get lots of it in there. And is that the same approach when you're working with something like Jim Henson's Labyrinth, um, which has a lot of lore? Um, how do you ensure that fans' expectations are met while keep making sure that the environment is also interactive and fun and fresh and new? Yeah, we were more than a little terrified of disappointing <laughs> Um, the fans, but the good news was we were fans too. So we, we knew if we were not insulting ourselves, if we were able to feel like we were uh, in, as much in love with these characters in these places in our approach to designing them, that we'd be pretty safe. I think that the, the sort of two things that came out of it that were uh, revelations, one was one of the original puppeteers came on and did a talk about we played around with her and she had actually performed many of the characters. And she said, it feels like I'm in the sets from 40 years ago. Well, absolutely. She was not because we were a low poly non-textured <laughs> environment. And yet somehow we'd captured the mood and feel of those environments that, that she amazing. remembered having participated. The other challenge was with that course was the first time we had animated characters in it. And it's the same problem that theme parks have. If you have an animated figure who's going through a loop of animations, it, it can feel fake mm. and feel um, not alive. Uh, and so we worried about that. Uh, all, the promise of interaction with characters was heavy on us. Like, do I get to talk to Hoggle? Do I get to see these characters? And... Uh, we we made the decision to allow them to be in a loop 
but that the loop was so in keeping with their character in that moment in the story that you were able to forgive that they weren't making eye contact with you and, and interacting with your ball or, or, or whether you got a par or not. And I think Hoggle's a perfect example. He's just going through his little cycle where he's spraying fairies <laughs> and um, nobody questions why isn't he noticing I'm here? They're just so delighted to be in the presence of him in a way that you never thought you were ever going to be, that you're willing to forgive the fakeness of the fact that it's a looping character. Um, right. And we've made that approach with all the characters and, and, and you know, animals and things that we've animated. Um, animation is expensive and, and a you know, rigged model is expensive. So we, we're really trying to do that as little as possible. But when we do it, it's because it's meant to accent something that adds depth and life to the environment, like the, the writable sea life in Atlantis. Yeah, that, that, was, that was super enlightening in terms of the actual process that it takes. It's, it's, it's very deep, very collaborative. In terms of ensuring that people experience it the way you want it to experience, do you do a lot of play testing to ensure that you're getting user feedback uh, with each one of these courses? How detailed is that? Or is it just something that you can do internally and say, hey, no, that was fun. I think we got it. You know, this is miniature golf, right? We're not, yeah. we're not building a rocket ship. How does yeah. that go about? Yeah, we, we do not do, you know, like we don't bring people cold off the street to play our game to get their opinions. We, we as a company, we all play and consume our own product all the time. So we're constantly getting feedback there. But also we have a, a very active beta and even an alpha uh, uh, group on um, on Discord. And so a, a rare handful of people get to see it in its rawest sort of sausage being made uh, style. Um, and then the beta team will use, often get to see it weeks before it releases or even that we've announced it. Uh, but they're... They're real avid players and a good mix of sort of aesthetic commentary as well as gameplay commentary. And so we owe a lot to the, this, this sort of small army of beta testers and alpha testers that, that really understand what our product is, um, make really, really smart observations and tweaks that make the game better uh, because of it. Um, yeah, as much as I think I would love to be able to see something before it's released, I personally, I really like to see what the finished, I want to see the finished production, not necessarily watch it. So it takes a brave individual who's willing to, to, to see all the burrs and the unfinished bits and pieces that we, we show these folks. And I think you get a little bit of um, leeway too, considering that it's, it's mini golf, right? And yeah. you're supposed to be on a set. Um, it's you're, you're not expecting these um, maybe creatures to be alive. It's, it's very similar to what you experience in miniature, miniature golf. So I think that also gives the viewer more of a reality or uh, acceptance of what's going on. Because I'm sure you've experienced this. When designing VR uh, environments, when you're looking at early builds without the lighting and without the animation, without the rigging, um, they just feel like almost like a set, like a, yeah. like a you know, a fake set with cutouts and, you know, things that are baked in and then, and it's really the lighting and the animation of the characters that come to life that make it feel like a, a, a real environment. But do you yeah. think because walkabout mini golf is a golf course, you, you guys can do a lot of those things and not have to get that flat feedback or, or that lashing from, from you yeah. users? Yeah. We more often than not, we'll go, look, let's not get so serious. It's just mini golf. It's just mini golf. Uh, it's, it, it's a pressure valve that allows us not to get too highfalutin. Uh, another observation is that in the game industry, when you're creating a virtual place, we as game designers understand that the walls are only two side, one sided, right? If you were, we, a lot of work goes in to making sure you don't, pop the bubble of disbelief by like sticking your head through a wall to discover that the Wolfenstein, you know, dungeon isn't really real. It mm -hmm. actually is, is, a, is an illusion. Uh, when we introduced flying, which was, uh, uh, was a mistake. It was, uh, it was just something that sort of came out. It was so much fun. We released it. Uh, the question was, Oh my gosh, now people are going to be able to fly outside the building and see that the building is only one sided that they, they're going to be able to go underneath it and look at the entire guts of our, of our game. 
um, there was no way we were going to go rebuild everything to make it stylistically consistent, all mm. all services. So uh, Lucas's position was, nope, we're just going to let them see it. And so people can actively fly through the geometry and, and easily see the illusion, the sets that make up our, um, our environments. And what we've discovered is nobody cares. Right. They just... They, they love flying so much that they're willing to forgive the fact that it's fake and that if they want to sit on a rooftop of a building that only has half a building, they just turn their back to the part that's not finished and they, and they admire the stuff that's been, that has been designed to play to your eyes, uh, which is a surprise. You, it's, it's not intuitive. It's something you would imagine that, that that would pop the bubble of their illusion to be able to see that, that all these, these things are the rocks don't have bottoms and the, and the trees roots stop at the ground. Um, but uh, I think that's actually kind of the charm is that you're, you're, you're being trusted to, to still be lost in the theme, despite the fact that you can so easily break the illusion by flying through a wall. That reminds me so much of like when I, I used to play a lot of games and trying to find glitches to try to break the game, but then you can actually look behind the curtain and then look at how these assets are built. And you're like, oh, okay, that's kind of how they do it. So it's almost like for the viewer, it's kind of like a, a fun little surprise, especially if you like the understanding of how games are built. So I can see how even people flying and seeing the the rawness of it all, they they don't mind it. They're like, oh, this is this is how game development works. That's that's really cool. In, in light of um, Connect, you know, just to get topical, uh, I just came back from Meta Connect 2023. They announced uh, Codec avatars. They give you realistic avatars. They also announced the MetaQuest Pro. I mean, I'm sorry, MetaQuest 3, which I tried out. Um, it has color pass-through that uh, is really interesting. It kind of gives an uncanny valley effect, but doesn't really take you out of the experience. You're kind of looking through the lens and everything is colored almost like an Instagram filter way. It's, it's pretty yeah. surreal. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about some of the news with some of the new hardware with what Meta's announced and also, of course, Apple Vision Pro? And give me your thoughts on that, Don. Well, I think I, I think we, especially people who are using this hardware as a design tool would always love it to, to be better, faster, lighter, smaller. Um, I think I, I kind of had the epiphany uh, maybe a year or so ago that the perfect tool that I'm waiting for is never going to exist that really my, my ability to create is my ability to grab whatever tools available and leverage it as best I can to produce the work that I'm doing. So uh, like when the Quest Pro came out, I ran out and bought it in, at full price. And, and I'm really, really happy I did. I'm extremely happy with that tool. It does pretty much everything that I need it to do. The idea that something's coming along that's gonna make it better for me to do it, I'm overjoyed that it, it is. Excuse me, cut you off there. Sorry about that. Got a little coming okay. call. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the idea that these this new technology is going to come to make it easier and uh, and faster and more beautiful and light more lightweight, I'm incredibly thrilled about. But it's not stopping me from using the tool today that I have to produce the work that we're doing. Uh, I, I recently I went to uh, I went to Kinkos to get some color prints done, and they were giving me a test. And I needed 25 things done, and they gave me all 25 color pieces uh, in like 20 seconds. And she handed it to me, and she said, "So what do you think?" And I said, "I feel bad about judging a miracle." <laughs> <laughs> uh, I said, "Yes, I could complain about the magenta being a little too little too uh, prominent, but good God, you just produced 25 full color pieces in, in in 20 seconds." And I feel a little bit that way about VR. Is that that I know that these tools, you know, we all have wish lists of, of how we'd like our tools to be better and clearer and faster and, and more immersive. But um, I'm really happy with where we are now. Um, I think that the one missing piece, the one that's going to make all of this work for us is ubiquitousness and ease of, of entering these worlds. When I was freelancing in the 90s, I often would build a 3D model as part of the design process for these theme park projects. And I would do little fly-through videos of them. And I would send the drawing, but I would also send this video to the producer. And nine times out of 10, the producer would say, I didn't know what that a movie file was or, or move file or 
what I was supposed <laughs> to do with it. So I didn't look at it. That the the level of friction for them to to understand that they needed to look at this file was just too great for them. So as no matter how valuable it was, people, they weren't looking at it. Today, if I sent them a YouTube link, click, boom, consume, they would consume it. And I look, I'm looking hopefully that the VR world will have something where I can meet you in an environment together as quickly as texting you a link. And we know what that link does. And we know that we're immediately going to meet each other flawlessly. And we recognize each other in, you know, whether we're a, we're a, a purple Pikachu or we're a, you know, wherever we are, um, poop emoji, whatever we want to be, but that we'll show up in that environment and recognize and be able to consume that environment uh, with a click. And so that's the future I am, I am looking for. Uh, and I do hope that Meta and Apple, although they are their own walled gardens, are thinking about what is the YouTubeness of this? What is the, what is, how do I get people in here that doesn't involve um, the amount of clicking that we have to do to get them in there? I think that's, that's kind of the, the advantage we have right with walkabout is that here's a putter, here's a ball, hit the ball, <laughs> you're in. Uh, and uh, the, a private room is just, you, you agree upon a name, you type it in and boom, you're in it. I would love to see that happen with all products and all VR experiences. So that's the future that I can't wait for. Uh, and in the meantime, I'll happily upgrade my headsets to be whatever the new thing is. I couldn't agree more. Um, checking out the Quest 3, it took forever just to even get a demo because there's a lot of setup and you're talking to people who are invited who are already in the industry. So yeah. there should be no issues and friction points to just go ahead and give a demo and to accept the demo. But, you know, we're, we still have those friction points just because that's just the state of technology today. Yeah, today, yeah. Absolutely. Um, in terms of the future for Walkabout Mini Golf, what, what are the other plans to explore other iconic stories and new original narratives in, in the upcoming courses? When I started, I said, hey, I have an idea of a course. And they said, no, no, we have this board here with 100 ideas on it. <laughs> it was basically get in line, right. you stick your idea at the end of the 100. <laughs> so we have no end of places that we as a group want to build and uh, are well into building those uh, currently. So um, uh, we tend to pick IPs that are kind of off the wall that, are, that you wouldn't expect that that would would make like Meow Wolf's a perfect example of what a perfect who would have thought to put a miniature golf course there but it's just perfect that that's what we're doing um and then uh we have the, the our own ip things like the the villains layers which are just we just would love to make build them and that would be a fun place to hang out and then we have sort of um sort of a cultural public domain ips like Jules Verne where we don't necessarily have to partner with with a studio or with an author to, to be able to do it. Uh, our jo job is just to deliver upon what those books of that media uh, has promised as best we possibly can. So. Can't wait to experience Mail Wolf in, in Walkabout. That's going to be fascinating. Uh, where can people find you, Don? Um, I am, I'm on Instagram, on Don J. Carson on Instagram. Um, I have a website, doncarsoncreative.com. And I've got a, I've got a Patreon page. Uh, I mainly produced it so that I could talk shop with people who just like wanted to deep dive into theme parks and VR. That is cool. And, and so, so I feel uncomfortable with there being a price for it. Pretty much people pay for my coffee. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you everybody for my coffee. <laughs> um, but it, what it does is it means that we can have like really deep conversations about really esoteric stuff. Uh, and I'm constantly sort of writing, doing videos and writing up papers and about, about whatever anybody wants to talk about. Uh, and I also, I'm more, I'm freer about talking about things that I might feel more uncomfortable talking about, you know, because of agreements with past clients and things, um, in a public way, I can talk sort of privately with the people on Patreon. So, so that's a place to find me too. That's fantastic. So all of you listening, if you want a cheat code to understand how Imagineers build theme parks and then how to translate that into your VR experiences, I, I can't tell you enough what, what a cheat code that would be is to support Don's Patreon. That's, that's awesome. 
fantastic, Don. I, I really appreciate you as a guest and uh, thank you so much. Well, thanks for having me. This is really a pleasure. Cool. Thanks, Don. That was